So brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Now two weeks ago we had the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement service. And this is kind of the uh, second part of that, you could say, because there is another aspect here of the Day of Atonement that I wanted to teach you guys. But obviously in between the Day of Atonement and today, we've had the Feast of Tabernacles, and then last week we had our anniversary service as well. So I wanted to uh, do a teaching today on the other aspect of the Day of Atonement, which we find right here in Leviticus 25. So just to recap, the Day of Atonement is considered to be the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. And it's the day where the high priest makes atonement for the Jewish nation of Israel by the sacrifice of a goat. And then also the scapegoat. There's two goats involved here. There's the sacrificial goat and there's the scapegoat as well. The term scapegoat, which you will know, comes from the Bible. It comes from Levit Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. And it was upon the scapegoat that the sins of the Jewish people would be laid upon and they would drive the scapegoat into the wilderness. So Jesus, of course just in the same way that he's the Passover lamb, he's also the Yom Kippur scapegoat. There is two systems of atonement that we see in the Old Testament, and Jesus is, of course, the fulfillment of both. But as we said, in Leviticus 25 right here, there is a certain aspect of the Day of Atonement which is yet to be fulfilled, and that's what we want to look at today, and that is known as the Year of Jubilee. In Hebrew, it's called Hashanah HaYovel. Hashanah HaYovel. Now, Yovel kind of means like a ram's horn. It's another, it's another name for a ram's horn that we see in the Bible. The most common name that we see, of course, is the shofar, ram's horn. But Yovel is kind of another name for that. Now, it's not actually a different ram's horn. It's more a difference in the meaning of this particular blast that we're going to see here in Leviticus 25. So it's a slightly different meaning that we see here. And it's a very overlooked doctrine, is the year of Jubilee, uh, mainly because it hasn't been observed for thousands of years. It's something which, you know, is no longer observed. It's no longer the, something that really can be observed. But it's something that certainly does have a, a significance for the last days. And that's why, even though it's not something which can be observed and hasn't been observed for a very long time now, it's still something very important to understand because it does have a very large significance in the return of Christ. So that is why it's important to understand what the year of Jubilee is all about. We always hear this term, you know, the, the, the year of Jubilee, and people don't actually know what it means. In English, Jubilee kind of means like an anniversary, doesn't it? You know, the, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee we had recently. Um, but in biblical thought here, it's a bit different. So in Leviticus 25... From verses 1 to 7, we see what's called the Sabbath year. We've all, we've all heard of the Sabbath, the uh, seventh day, and we also see that there's a Sabbath year. So in other words, the land would have to rest for a whole year. There'd be six years of planting and reaping, and then there'd be a year of rest. The land would basically have a year of rest. And any farmer or anyone who knows anything about agriculture will tell you that it's very productive for the land to have a year's rest, to lay fallow. Any farmer will tell you it's more productive when you do this. So the land would have a Sabbath rest. And when you see a, a cycle of seven here like this, it's known as a Shemitah. A Shemitah is a cycle of seven in Hebrew, something you see quite a bit in the Bible. Now, after this instruction to have a Sabbath year, we see that there's an instruction to then count seven Sabbath years. So anyone who's good at maths will know that seven times seven is 49 49. So every 49 years would be the year of Jubilee in the 50th year. It would always be 49 and then in the 50th year would be the year of Jubilee. So the year of Jubilee is something that only occurred every 50 years. 7 times 7, 49 and then in the 50th year would be the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee there would be a special trumpet blast on the Day of Atonement. Now remember, we had also, before the Day of Atonement, there was the Feast of Trumpets, wasn't there? Yom Teruah is the original name for that. It's known now as Rosh Hashanah, but it's Yom Teruah in the Scriptures. You had the Feast of Trumpets, where of course there'd be the blowing of trumpets, and then there would be ten days, a ten-day period, known as Yanim Noraim, the Days of Awe, which would be a ten-day period of repentance leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So every 50 years, there'd be a special trumpet blast on the Day of Atonement in the year of Jubilee. And that trumpet blast is to proclaim liberty throughout the land, as we're going to see. 
Leviticus 25, and we'll go from verse 8. Verses 1 to 7, we saw that there was a, an instruction to have a Sabbath year. But in Leviticus 25 from verse 8, this is where we're going to see the instruction to observe the year of Jubilee. Hashanah Yovel. Leviticus 25 verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years. At the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. So as I said, every 50 years in the year of Jubilee, there'd be a special trumpet blast on the day of atonement, on the tenth day of the seventh month. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. Who's been to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Anyone been to Philadelphia? If you go to Philadelphia, you will see the Liberty Bell. What verse is on the Liberty Bell? That verse right there, Leviticus 25.10. Proclaim liberty throughout the land and towards its inhabitants. It's right there on the Liberty Bell in Pennsylvania. Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession. And each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. And, it, and in it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, neither the grapes of your untended vine. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. So these laws are designed so that no one is oppressed. This is why God put these laws in the Bible for Israel to observe. It was for fairness that no one was oppressed. Now the first meaning here of the year of Jubilee is, as we see, the possession. Each one shall return to his possession. What this is talking about, this is talking about land. This is talking about the land that they owned. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 13 onwards, what we see is when the Israelites came into the promised land, they were allocated an inheritance of land. All the tribes and the clans and the families and all this kind of people were allocated an inheritance of land in the promised land. So the names of all the tribes of Israel, of course, we think they're tribal names, and they are, but they're also what we would call counties or districts, or, or states as you'd have in America. They were also districts. So they were all given an inheritance of land in the land of Israel. But over the years, what would happen is, this land would eventually, the land that you had might have to be sold. If someone went into poverty or got into debt, and they were forced to sell their land, then obviously this land would end up exchanging hands quite a bit. Now the thing is, according to this ancient Jewish law, is that you could never buy land permanently. You could never buy and own land permanently. You could only, what we would call today, lease it. This is the ancient equivalent of leasing. So it's like when you buy a flat in an apartment building. When you buy a flat, you don't actually own the leasehold. That is still owned by the owner, the real owner. When you buy a flat, you don't actually technically own it. Did you know that? If there's a... 60-year lease left on it, then the value of that flat is going to diminish. But if there's like a 900-year lease, which we see quite a bit, there's no issue, and it will have its full value. But even if it's a 900-year lease or a 60-year or a year lease, you don't technically own that flat, because obviously the person who owns the building the flat is in owns that flat. You're just leasing it. So this is the ancient equivalent of leasing. When you bought land, you didn't actually own the land, you only got its use. You could use the land, it's like when you buy a flat. You use it as your own, it's your own flat. You've paid for it and you do what you want with it. And this is the same, when you bought the land, you got its use. So you could use it for the crops and for harvesting and this sort of thing, but you didn't actually own the land. 
And of course, when you sold the land because of debt or things like this, the closer you were to the next year of Jubilee, the less expensive it would be. And the further away from the next year of Jubilee, the more expensive it would be. Again, it works the same today, doesn't it? Now, there's a reason why the Lord did not allow anyone to permanently own any land in the land of Israel. And we see that further on in Leviticus 25, in verse 23. If you go to Leviticus 25, in verse 23, it says, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the land of your possession you shall grant redemption of the land." So what he's saying here is that no Jew could ever own any land permanently in Israel because the land belongs to the Lord. Now recently I've had a lot of debates about this issue, about who the land of Israel belongs to. And of course you'll hear me say many times, the land of Israel has belonged to the Jews for thousands of years. The so-called Palestinians, who are actually Egyptians and Jordanians, is no such thing as a Palestinian ethnically. The Jews are the rightful inhabitants of that land, and I always say it belongs to the Jews, not to the Palestinians. They have no place there. They have no historical claim there. However, even that isn't technically correct. It's the Lord who owns the land of Israel. That's his land. And in his sovereignty, he gave that land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is the Lord's land to give to who he wants, and he gave it to Israel, the Jews. So even when I say to people, the land does not belong to Arab Muslims, it belongs to the Jews, even that is not technically correct. I just say that for the sake of a debate. However, it's the Lord's land. And that is why no Jew was ever allowed to permanently own land. In the next year of Jubilee, whether it was in 49 years or whether it was in one year, all the land reverted back to the land allocation in the book of Joshua. So that is what it means, everyone shall return to his possession. If you became poor or in debt and you was forced to sell your land, you got it back in the next year of Jubilee. It all had to revert back to those land allocations that we see in the book of Joshua from chapter 13 onwards. We won't go into that because there's lots of, you know, the borders and it describes all the territories for the different families and clans and all these people. But all the land reverted back. It was like a reset. It went back to how God allocated it in the book of Joshua every 50 years. Also, it says you can grant redemption for the land. So in other words, if you were forced to sell your land because of debt or poverty, a relative could come and redeem it for you. We see examples of this in the Bible. We see, for example, in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is actually all about this. Boaz redeems the field that belonged to Elimelech, his relative, the husband, of, the husband of Naomi. Boaz redeems that field, doesn't he? We also see an example in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 32. Jeremiah purchases his uncle's field, even though they're about to go into the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah redeems his uncle's field. So if you lost your land because of debt or poverty, a relative could redeem it back into the family. Or you could wait until the next year of Jubilee. Either way, you got it back. You had to wait to the next year of Jubilee or a relative could redeem it for you. And again, the reason that the Lord established these laws this way is so that no Jew could ever own land permanently in the land of Israel because the land belongs to the Lord God. As I said, in the year of Jubilee, all that land, all resetted back to those land allocations that we see in the book of Joshua. Now this mirrors, of course, what's going to happen when Christ returns. Because when Christ returns, there is going to be a trumpet blast. And what that means is, is that the land goes back to the original owner, doesn't it? Now when we sinned against God, when mankind fell into sin, what happened? Satan was the one who became the legal owner of this earth. The world fell into the hands of the devil. It says that many times, doesn't it, in the Bible, that the God of this world, with a small g... The God of this world is Satan. Satan's the God of this world. That's why we see the world the way it is. A world where abortion is celebrated. A world where homosexuality is celebrated. A world where perversion is celebrated. It's because it's a world which belongs to the devil. And 1 John chapter 5 verse 19 says, This world lies under the power of the wicked one. And why? Because of sin. It is because of sin that Satan became the rightful and legal owner of this world. But when we become born again, we become what the Bible calls a stranger and a foreigner in this world. We become part of a different kingdom. And that's why the Bible says that we are in the world but not of it. 
We are in the world, but not of it. Hallelujah. So when Jesus returns, he's not returning alone as well. He's returning with us. He's going to return with the saints to take back the possession. The world which fell into the hands of Satan can only be for so long. It's not forever. One day, Satan is going to be forced to give up this world. Just like a man was forced to give up the land in the year of Jubilee, on the trumpet blast, on the Day of Atonement, when Jesus returns at that trumpet blast, Satan will be forced to surrender this world to Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And that trumpet blast we see in Revelation chapter 11 in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That is when we see that transaction take place. Jesus Christ coming back to take back what was his. He returns to the land that was lost. That is the whole point of the year of Jubilee. Hallelujah. We see this foreshadowed again in the book of Joshua. We're going through the book of Joshua right now in our fellowship meetings. And in the story of Jericho, it parallels Revelation. Basically, Joshua chapter 6 foreshadows Revelation chapters 6 to 11. And we see Jericho encircled seven, seven times, don't we? Seven times. And then on the seventh time, there's another seven set, as we see in the book of Revelation. Seven seals and seven trumpets. And that trumpet that we saw right there, in chapter 11, in, Re in Revelation, is the same trumpet that we saw at Jericho in Joshua chapter 6, in verse 12. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the walls came tumbling down, and we all know the story, don't we? So right there we see a direct parallel between the, the trumpet blown in Joshua chapter 6 the trumpet blown in Revelation chapter 11, and of course the trumpet blown here in Leviticus 25. It's all connected. You can connect all those trumpet blasts as the Jubilee trumpet blast on the Day of Atonement, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever with us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So Jesus Christ is returning to take back what was usurped by the devil, and again, it's a reset, isn't it? They talk about the great reset coming. Well, there is a great reset coming. And it's not coming from Klaus Schwab. It's going to come from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come to establish a great reset. The land all was put back to the land allocations in the book of Joshua from chapter 13 onwards. And it's exactly what's going to happen when the Lord returns. It's all going to get reset to the original owner. There's a great reset coming. And Jesus Christ is the one who's going to bring it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And just like you couldn't own land permanently, just like you couldn't buy land permanently, Satan cannot have this world permanently either because it belongs to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now the second meaning that we see in Levit Leviticus 25, there is a second meaning. We said, each one shall return to his family. What does that mean? It means it was the year where slaves went free. Proclaim liberty throughout the land. It was the year where slaves got to return home. They went back to their family. And we see this in Leviticus 25, if we continue in verse 39. Leviticus 25 in verse 39. And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of jubilee. So a slave could only serve until the year of Jubilee. Notice as well there's provisions here against barbaric slavery. People say the Bible condones slavery. Rubbish. Have you actually ever read it? There's provisions here against the barbaric slavery that they're talking about. There's conditions and instructions against barbaric slavery. It preserves the rights of, of servants and slaves. Verse 41. And then he shall depart from you. He and his children with him, he shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. Now, 
Notice as well, this is talking about Hebrew slaves. No one was able to own a Hebrew slave permanently. They had to go free in the year of Jubilee. And the same thing would happen. They would calculate the price accordingly. When you purchased a slave, if there was a long time until the next year of Jubilee, then the price would be greater. If the year of Jubilee was coming up quite soon, the price would be a lot lower. Again, it would just be like when you purchase a house with a, uh, or a flat with a very small lease on it. The value would diminish. So they would have to wait until the next year of Jubilee, or, again, they could be redeemed by a family member. It's the same sort of thing. If someone was poor and was forced to sell themselves into slavery, then a family member could redeem them from slavery. If a family member had quite a bit of wealth and they was able to meet all the terms and conditions, then they would basically redeem their family member from slavery. Or the slave would have to wait until the next year of Jubilee. Let us continue in Leviticus 25 from verse 47. Now if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a, fa- or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. So there you go. After the slave is sold, there is an option to redeem them by a family member. After he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who is near of kin to him or his family may redeem him. Or if he is able to redeem him himself, thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. There you go. So the price would be according to when the next year of Jubilee was. It shall be according to the time of a hired servant for him. If there are still many years remaining, according to them he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money which he was bought. In other words, you had to basically make up the price for that servant's work. If that servant was able to put in seven years more work until the next year of Jubilee, then the price would be basically seven years worth of labor. Verse 52. And if there remain but a few years until the Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him according to his years. He shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with vigor over him in your sight. Again, more provisions there against barbaric slavery. They had to treat slaves fairly. And if he is not redeemed in these years, again, this is talking about redemption by a family member. If he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee. So either way, the slave went free. No one could ever remain. If you was an Israelite, you could never remain in perpetual slavery. He shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants who I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So again, slaves could be released in the year of Jubilee, or sooner than that, they could be redeemed by a family member, and of course, silver would be the price they'd have to pay. Silver it always has to do with redemption. Whenever you see redemption in the Bible, silver is, is a typological Old Testament of redemption. However, if there was no one to redeem them, if no family member was able to redeem them, then they waited until the next year of Jubilee, and then they went free. Again, no one from Israel was ever able to remain in perpetual slavery. And It tells us why in verse 42. What did it say in verse 42? For they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. So God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt to be his servants. He said, these are my servants. I rescued them from slavery in Egypt so that they will be my servants. And that is why no Israelite was ever allowed to remain in perpetual slavery. That is why these provisions and laws are right here. Now, of course... This all has another meaning as well, in that we were all slaves to sin. According to John 8 and Romans 6, we were all slaves and we were all slaves to sin. There was no one to redeem us apart from one, wasn't there? There was no one to redeem us apart from one. The thing is, though, we didn't have an opportunity to be released in any year of Jubilee. Our slavery was not until our redemption or until the next year of Jubilee. Our slavery was eternal. We were in eternal slavery. If you was a slave in the land of Israel, you got to go free in the year of Jubilee regardless. 
Our slavery was not until the next year of Jubilee. Our slavery was eternal. And that's why it took a lot more than just silver to release us from our slavery. Because it wasn't a slavery of a few years. It was eternal slavery to sin. And that is why it took a lot more than just silver. It took the blood of Jesus Christ. As we saw in uh, the communion we've just taken, Josh read a verse from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that redeemed us from our sin. That's what it took. Silver was never enough. All the silver in the world could never have redeemed you and I from our slavery, our slavery to sin. It took the blood of God's only son, Jesus Christ, to set us free from the slavery that we were trapped in. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And it says in Hebrews in chapter 9, remember Hebrews is always paralleling, paralleling Leviticus. If you want to understand Leviticus, you read Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15, it says that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies just as the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement with the blood of the goat. Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven, the real one. And he didn't sprinkle it with the blood of goats or bulls, but with his own blood. He sprinkled it with his own blood, securing eternal redemption for you and I. So just as our slavery was eternal, our redemption is also eternal. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that is the partial fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, in that when Jesus sacrificed his life for our sin, he entered the Holy of Holies, just like the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. And just in that way, Jesus entered the Holy of Holies with his own blood, securing our eternal redemption. That is the partial fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. But there is a future fulfillment to come. And that's why, even though none of this has been observed for many, many hundreds of years, it is still important to understand this because it has a meaning for you and I, brothers and sisters. Because the ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement comes at that final trumpet blast when liberty is proclaimed throughout the land and when Jesus Christ comes back to take back this world to himself. Now, this is what actually is alluded to in Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61... From verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, this is obviously what Jesus read in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. Anyone who knows Luke chapter 4 very well would know that Jesus read this in the synagogue. He was taking part in the weekly Torah reading. They still have it to this day in the synagogues. Only there's a little thing that you should notice is that he didn't actually read the whole of verse 2. He closed the book halfway through verse 2. He read up to to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. He didn't read on. Why? Because when he came the first time, it was to fulfill the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim liberty to the captives. But when he returns the second time, what's it going to be? The day of vengeance. The day of vengeance. That was not fulfilled when Jesus Christ came the first time. That's why he closed the book halfway through a verse. The day of vengeance is coming. It hasn't come yet. It's coming. So you could say that Jesus Christ was a dispensationalist, as I tell people all the time. Whenever people have a problem with the idea of dispensationalism, I will say, well, why did Jesus close a book halfway through a verse? That means he was a dispensationalist, and that means you're not in agreement with Jesus himself. Dispensationalism means the different periods of time divided up. That's why it says to rightly divide the word of God. Some things only apply for... Israel, some things apply for the church, some things apply for both, some things apply for the last days. This is how dispensationalism works. And this is why so many people get things so horribly wrong, isn't it? So he closes the book halfway through a verse. The acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Now remember, the Redeemer is called the Goel in Hebrew. The Goel is the Redeemer. That's what Boaz was, who redeemed Ruth from her life of slavery because widows were eventually sold into slavery so Boaz redeemed Ruth from slavery and also the redeemer had a second role it wasn't just to redeem relatives from slavery but it was also to take vengeance 
upon anyone who kills a family member. You was allowed to take vengeance upon a, a, a person who killed a relative of yours. They was designated as the avenger of blood. It's called the avenger of blood. It's Goel Hadam. Dam is blood in Hebrew. Goel Hadam is avenger of blood. And it was designated to the Redeemer to take vengeance upon anyone who killed a family member. And we see examples of this in the Old Testament as well, where people were designated as avengers. And that's what Jesus Christ is returning as. He came as the Redeemer, but he's going to return as the avenger of blood. He's going to take vengeance upon his enemies, isn't he? We see examples of this in Isaiah. 63 we see this in Revelation 14 we see that Jesus is going to take out vengeance upon his enemies so when he returns it's the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God it sounds a bit contradictory doesn't it how is it how can it be the acceptable favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God well it depends do you know him do you belong to him if you know him and if you belong to Jesus Christ, it's going to be the favourable year of the Lord. If you don't know him, it's going to be the day of vengeance. It's going to be the day of vengeance of our God. And that's why it's important to know him, because if you don't know him, if you don't belong to him, then you are going to be left behind to face the day of vengeance, the day of vengeance of our God. If you belong to Jesus Christ, however, it is going to be the favourable year. The favourable year, the year of jubilee, when the captives are set free and the land reverts back to its original owners. So remember, Jesus Christ is coming back to take vengeance upon his enemies and also to take back the world that was taken from him through our sin. And also, it's going to be given to us. We are going to inherit the kingdom of God. It says in Daniel 7, the kingdom was given to the saints. So it's you and I who are also going to reign with Jesus. And that's our inheritance that awaits us. We have an inheritance undefiled and uncorruptible, as it says in 1 Peter. We have an inheritance awaiting for us, but it's only for those who are in Christ. Outside of Christ, your only inheritance is out of darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the only inheritance you get outside of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the day of vengeance for those who do not know him. But for those who do know him, it's going to be the favourable year of the Lord, the year of jubilee. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray and give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day and for this time together. We do thank you, Heavenly Father, for these wonderful pictures of salvation that we find hidden throughout the Old Testament. And we thank you, Lord, that the deeper we understand those, the deeper we understand what it is truly to be saved and redeemed. And Lord, we just pray that you will just continue to teach us these things, to give us a deeper understanding of yourself and a deeper understanding of what you've done for us by sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for our sin, to redeem us from slavery to sin and to give us an inheritance in your kingdom. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that it's not because of any goodness of us, because we'll be able to boast. We thank you that your word says that we are saved by grace through faith, lest any man should boast. We thank you, Lord, that we will not be able to boast on that day, but it's only in you that we'll be able to boast, Lord. And Lord, keep us humble every time that we come before you, every time that we offer up prayers and praises to you, Every time that we worship you, every time that we open up your word, humble us, Lord, and remember that it's only because of your blood and your grace and your mercy that we have any right to come before you. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness, his perfect righteousness that lives in each of us. And may we show that same humility to others, Lord, to remember that we too are deserving of condemnation and, and wrath because of our sin. But we thank you that because of his grace and his mercy, Jesus Christ came down and snatched us out of the fires of hell and set us free from the curse of sin to give us a new life, a new life in Jesus Christ, the life that awaits us in the kingdom, the eternal life that all of us now have who are born again. And we thank you today, Lord, that we can come to your table to remember the body and blood of your dear son that cleanses us from all sin. And we thank you, Lord, that that favourable year is coming. 
For those who don't know you, it's a day of vengeance. But for those who do know you, it's a favourable year, the year of Jubilee. And we thank you, Lord, that those who are in Christ, those who are redeemed, will be reigning in that kingdom with our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And it's in his mighty name that we pray. It's in his mighty name that we worship you, Lord. The name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen.